Well, good morning, and we welcome you once again to the Odyssey Church, and we hope you enjoyed the service so far, especially if you're a person who doesn't normally like to come to church. We want you to know if you're a person who doesn't normally like to come to church, you're exactly the reason, you're exactly the person that we started the Odyssey Church for. So we're glad you're here this morning. And we don't want to compromise the Word of God. I think we need to speak the whole counsel of the Word of God. I think we have to talk about His love and His grace and His mercy, and we need to talk about it often. But I don't think you can understand God's love if you don't understand His wrath. So we need to speak about the entire counsel of the Scripture. Don't want to compromise the Word of God, but we do want to cater, we do want to tailor the experience around those who have maybe grown up in church before, and uh, they've been here all their life, and also those who don't like to come to church, who don't normally like to come. We want to create environments that are so exciting and so inviting that no matter who you are, whether you believe in Jesus, whether you just start to seek out who He is, whether you're not quite sure yet, or whether you've been walking with Him your entire life, that you will love to attend the Odyssey Church. And we do that, and we've always said we don't have a hidden agenda. We do that so that we hope that one day, one day, something that's said, something that's seen, something that's heard, something will click inside of it, and you'll see that Jesus is exactly who He said He was. That He is the living God. That He is the risen Savior. That He is God Himself who came to walk among His people. And we're so fortunate. We've already begun to see lives that have begun to be changed. There's people that come to the church today that weren't going to church two or three months ago when we first opened up. Because we know that if we change enough lives, if there's enough transformation, that not only will single lives be changed, but workplaces will be changed, communities will be changed, schools will be changed. And our desire is, our prayer is, that God will help us be His hands here on earth, that people can see Jesus through here. So if you haven't been here for the last, uh, we're in the very last part of a three-part sermon series called Why We Do What We Do, and we've had some technical difficulties as, as we've been trying to put these things in order, so hopefully they'll all be up on the internet uh, within just a couple weeks. Now, at the end of last week, what we started with was we were telling the, the what behind the why, but we started with the Great Commission. We started with the Great Commission as found in the Gospel of Matthew. It brings together the entire Gospel of Matthew to its grand finale. The triumphant, resurrected Lord sends forth his ambassadors to proclaim the good news, to pronounce a victory by Jesus Christ through his disciples. Jesus gives us this great commission to go forth and make disciples, and then he gives us a great authority. So in the great commission, we have a great authority, and then he gives us this great promise. Jesus says, I'll never leave you. I may leave you physically, but I'll never leave you spiritually. You don't have to do this on your own. I will be with you even to the end of the age. That it's in his power, not our power, that we go forth and make disciples. And he promises us that he'll go with us. So great commission, great authority, and a great promise. And then last week, we, we talked about, you know, who is this church for? It, who is the church for? Is it for church people or is it for unchurched people? Is it for the insiders or is it for the outsiders? And if you missed that message, I, I would just simply urge you to go and watch it at either www.theodysseychurch.com or at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash The Odyssey Church. And don't watch it because it's just such a great story. We know that's not true. Watch it because I believe it tells us what the church should be doing. And when I say the church, I'm talking about the body of Christ. It's the what behind the why of the Odyssey Church. So, so even if you disagree with it, at least you'll know why we started the Odyssey Church and what the what is behind the why. And in case you can't wait for it to be posted, I'm just going to tell you the big idea behind the message, and it's not original. In fact, we got it from the brother of Jesus, from a man named James. And James said, we should not make it difficult for the people who are turning to God. Another way of saying that is we should make it easy for people who want to find and follow Jesus. Now we're going to finish up this series with the how behind the why. The how behind the why we do what we do. Not so much how the Odyssey Church, we've sort of spoken about that over the last couple weeks. Uh, we want to make environments so exciting, so inviting, people will love to attend the Odyssey Church. They'll come even if they aren't convinced quite yet that Jesus is who he says he is. And we want to create these environments because we want to lead people into a deeper relationship 
with Jesus Christ. So that maybe one day, something will just click in their minds and Jesus will become Lord over their life. But let's face facts. You know, the Odyssey Church isn't anything but a name without the people who come here. The building itself isn't the church. You're the church. You don't become members of the Odyssey Church. You become much members of something much bigger than that. You become part of the church. You know, the Greek word which we translate church is actually a word that means ecclesia, and at the root of that word, it means movement. And movements move, don't they? And buildings don't move. So, as I was studying for this, I thought I had in my mind what God wanted me to say. But I have to tell you, as I started to say this, that God, uh, it came out a lot different than what I thought it was going to come out. God revealed some new light on some new things that I'd never seen before. You know, I heard a friend of mine say this week, he said, we're all toddlers in Christ. He's infinite, and we're finite. What we think is light today becomes darkness over time. And, and I think that's one of the reasons God's Word is called the living Word. Yet as God reveals to us His light, He takes us deeper and deeper and deeper and reveals to us more light as we go along. So what is light today becomes darkness tomorrow. Now I'm going to start out by asking you a question. Now I want you to raise your hand if you like to be happy. I think everybody should have their hands up. I mean, I can't think of anybody who doesn't desire to be happier than they are at the moment, no matter how happy they are right now or how unhappy they are right now. You know, I think happiness is a goal that we all can agree on, right? I mean, let's face it. We all like to be happy. In fact, if you were to make a list of all the things that you'd like to have in your life, if I gave you a paper and a pencil and said, listen, give me the top ten things that you would have if money was no object at all, time was no object at all, what are the ten things you'd like to have? And, and more than likely, the ten things that you put on your list would be things that you thought would make you happy, at least thought they would make you happy. We think to ourselves, you know, if I had more money, I'd be happier. If I had a bigger house, I'd be happier. You know, if I had a different job or a different boss, I'd be happy. And some of you might be thinking, you know, I'd be happier if I could just find somebody to share my life. If I could just get married, I'd be happy. And then there's some of you who say, well, you know, if I could just not be married anymore. Maybe I would be happy. I don't know. I don't want to get into all that. Whatever the case is, most of us link our happiness to another person or some other kind of, of outward circumstances which we have no control over or maybe a material thing that's just out of our reach. And Jesus said it. It's recorded by a man named John who wrote about Jesus' life as he witnessed it. He writes a gospel. It's named after himself. In chapter 10, verse 10, it Jesus says the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Now this is Jesus speaking. In some translations, it says, I came so they could live life and live it more abundantly. And I believe that one of the best ways for the devil is to steal our joy, to steal our happiness, to steal our peace, is to get us to concentrate on things that in the scope of eternity really mean nothing. Sometimes the devil hangs this stuff out in front of our face and we lose focus and we get stressed out and we get depressed. And whatever it is he's dang the phrase, we can't get to it so it affects us negatively. And then God comes along and God says, you know what? You don't need all those things to be happy. In fact, the reason you're not happy is you already have too much. And, and, and you trust in your stuff more than you trust in me. And then God begins to take some stuff out of our lives. The truth is, God wants us to be happy, and He wants us to be happy every day. And in a section of Scripture we're going to be looking at this morning, Jesus tells us how to have the happiness we desire, how to have that rich and satisfying life, that abundant life that He's designed for us, and then what the result of that rich and satisfying life looks like. So if you have your Bibles this morning, turn them to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. And we're only looking at the first eight verses this morning. That's the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. If you don't have your Bibles, that's okay, because the verses will be up here on the screen. You know, one of the, one of the things I learned a long time ago uh, is when you're studying a section of Scripture and you want to know what the author is trying to tell you, look at the words which are repeated most often. Now, I'm going to read this entire section of Scripture and try to pay attention to the words which are used most often. And somehow, I think you're going to be able to pick them out. The Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, and I'll be reading again this morning from the New Living Translation. Jesus said, I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce fruit. He prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so there will be produced even more. 
You've already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything that you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great joy to my Father. Now you can tell what the overall theme was. Were you able to see which words were repeated over and over? The Odyssey Church desires to be a church that fulfills the Great Commission by making disciples who make disciples, and our vision is to create environments so inviting and so excited that people will love to attend and that they'll keep coming back because we don't want to make it difficult for people to follow Jesus. And the reason we do this, the why, the how behind the why, is we want to move people from where they are to where God wants them to be. We want the Odyssey Church and the people who attend to bear much fruit so that we know we're true disciples of Jesus Christ and that we bring great glory to God the Father. We want to reach the unbelievers. We want to minister to the unconvinced. We want to serve the underprivileged and we want to mature the upright. So no matter where you are in Jesus Christ, we want to help you lead, we want to help lead you into a deeper relationship with Him. We want you to have an abundant, a rich, a satisfying life exactly as we were born for. And, and it's no wonder we so deeply desire it. God has programmed that right into us. Yet millions of Christians, and I know this was me, and it still is me at times, we set up for less and we aren't happy, our life isn't as satisfying as God would want it to be, because we misunderstand and we resist God's ways of bringing it about. Sometimes in order for us to have the life that God wants us to have, Less is more. Some things and maybe some people need to be pruned out of our lives. The setting of when Jesus gives his disciples this illustration of how to live the Christian life emphasizes just how important it is. It takes place on the night that Jesus would be betrayed, that he would be handed over to the Romans, that false testimony would be given against him. The next day, Jesus will be stretched out, hanging from a cross, sentenced to die, and execute. The Passover dinner, which you may know as the Last Supper, is over. And Jesus has told his disciples to follow him. And if you've ever heard the Easter story, then you know that as Jesus came into Jerusalem that week, the crowds were following Jesus. Was at the very top of his popularity. They were the crowds were laying their cloaks or their coats in front of him. They had palms and they had branches and they were waving and they were saying, Hosanna to him. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is at the very top of his popularity, but Jesus knows all of this is about to change. So when they leave that night, they don't leave out the front gate like they came in. They sort of go out through the back door. They go through what's known as the Kidron Valley, and they head towards Gethsemane. And they're walking, and as they're walking, they come along a great, great vineyard, and it's walking through this great vineyard that's here that Jesus gives his final instructions to his disciples. It's here in this great vineyard that Jesus gives the heart of his final message to his disciples on the night that he would be betrayed. The next day, Jesus is stretched out on a Roman cross. He's stripped, he's beaten, and he's left for dead. And Jesus had been telling those that were closest to him that he had an appointment with a cross and not with a throne. But like many of us, he, they only heard what they wanted to hear. But tonight, their dreams of Christ as a king will leave them lost and confused. You know, I imagine as Jesus was walking, he was probably leading, and his 11 remaining disciples were walking behind him. And I think Jesus sort of stops and turns and looks at him with a love that we can only imagine. He's about to tell them the final instructions on how to live the life that they were created for, how to live the abundant life, how to live this rich and satisfying life. A dying man's last words of instructions to those who were closest to him. And the disciples are beginning to realize that Jesus wasn't, that following Jesus wasn't going to turn out like they thought it was. And maybe for some of you, that's where you're at this morning. 
that you've been following Jesus, and you've been following him for a while, and maybe it's not turning out exactly like you expected. In fact, it's far different than what you were expecting. See, we think about a God who will help us win on our own terms. We fail to listen closely to his message. We fail to realize that it's not about us, but about a fruitful harvest. And sometimes you ever just wonder what God's up to. I mean, in my own life, it, 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 it's so many times I've thought that. And I'm thinking to myself, why isn't my life turning out like I expected? God, I've been doing everything you've asked me to do. I've tried to be so obedient. I know I mess up, but Lord, I'm really trying. Why is this turning out like it is? And Jesus, again, he reminds us it's not about us. It's about bearing fruit for God. And when we bear fruit for God, we're living the life that God desires us to live. And that's when, and that's only when we can truly find the abundant life, the rich life, the satisfying life. That's only when we can find true happiness. And Jesus, and being the master teacher, Jesus always starts with something familiar. It's amazing. Jesus loved to tell his deepest truth with simple earthly examples, things that we can still relate to today. And in his last message before his death, he wanted us to know that he left this planet for one reason and it has everything to do with fruit bearing. It's God's will that each one of us bear fruit, then bear more fruit, and then bear much fruit. And the essential condition for bringing forth much fruit is abiding or remaining in Jesus. He starts where we're at. He starts when we're confused and unsure. And he brings us to where he wants us to be. Living the life that he's designed for us. He does the same thing with each one of us. He takes us where we are and brings us to where he wants us to be. Living life here on earth as though we were heirs to a kingdom of heaven. Jesus tells each one of us to have this abundant, this rich, this satisfying life. And I would imagine Jesus as he turns to his disciples and he looks at him with this great, this amazing love that we can't even begin to comprehend. He points out to the vineyard and he says, I am the true great vine, and my Father is the gardener. And some of you may be thinking, you know, why would Jesus be talking about grapes when he's only a couple of hours away from death and the dreams of his best friends have been crushed? When we see Jesus say, I am the true grapevine, or I am the true vine, we just sort of sometimes read that, la, 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 it doesn't mean a whole lot to us. But to his disciples, this was mind-blowing. This was radical. They'd always been taught that Israel was the vine. I mean, maybe you remember when Moses sent out the 12 spies into the promised land, they came back and they had grapes so big, they, they were carried on a pole between two men. One man couldn't pick it up. It's a picture of God's promises. And if you're not familiar with the Bible, you may not know these verses, but I want to show them to you. I, I want to show you why Jesus, when he said he was a true vine, it would have been so important to his disciples. You know, King David, who wrote most of the Psalms, in Psalms 80, said, makes this claim. It says, you have brought a vine out of Egypt. You have cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root, and it filled the land. You know, this was a picture of the Exodus as the Israelites left Egypt to head towards the Promised Land. They were the vine, and God took them out of Egypt. Isaiah chapter 5, My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also a wine press. And he expected it to bring forth good grapes. You know, I challenge you one time to take a concordance, a, a Bible concordance, where they take the words of the Bible and they put them in alphabetical order, and then they tell you how many times they're listed in the Bible and where each word is used and what verses you can find. Take a concordance and see how many times in the Old Testament and the New Testament God uses the vine, the grape, the cluster, the wine as a description of Israel. I mean, the Israelites, the Jews, they were glad to be called God's vine. They were proud to be called God's vine. They, were, they told everybody they were God's vine. It's been said when Herod the Great rebuilt the temple, right over the temple great was a golden vine and great clusters made of pure gold that were as big as full-grown men. So when Jesus said he was the true vine, he dropped the bomb because that meant they weren't the true vine. And I, I love the fact that God's called the garden. 
You know, your translation might say husbandman or vine dresser. They all mean the one who takes care of the vineyard or takes care of the garden. What's a gardener do? Gardener works the soil. They'll fertilize it. They'll put up fences to protect their plants. They love, they care for, they watch over the plants so nothing destroys them. So they'll grow beautiful and strong. Sometimes they pull out the weeds and even prune and cut some things out so the plants will produce a, a more beauty and more fruit. I'm so glad I got a heavenly gardener who's watching over me and caring for me. And here's the thing. If, if, you, if you call yourself a Christian, we know he's talking to us. Because verse 2 says he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they'll produce even more. And then he says you have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. You know, some of this, some people have taught this and and. I've even thought this, that maybe this is a saying that maybe you can lose your salvation or, or if we don't produce anything, we're going to be taken away and we're going to be burned up. Can we lose our salvation? Can we be taken away and burned up? You know, I, I don't know. That may or may not be true, but if you're going to proclaim that, if you're going to say that, you don't use these verses. Jesus is talking to his disciples. And another word for purified is cleansed. He says, you've already been clean because of the words which I have spoken to you. If you believe and you confess Jesus Christ and you've made a word over your life, you've been made clean. Not because of anything you've done, but because of what Jesus has done. So we know this message, this passage, this, this talking about fruit bearing is talking to his disciples. And if I don't abide, if I don't remain in a vine, I'm worthless when it comes to fruit bearing. That's what he's meaning. We might get burned out, but according to these verses, we're not going to get burned up. And if I'm not remaining, and I'm not abiding in Jesus, and I'm not bearing fruit, then no matter how happy or unhappy I am, I am not living as abundantly. I'm not living as richly and satisfying as Jesus wants me to. I'm selling for the lesser instead of the better. But to have the best, sometimes we have to be pruned. And nobody wants to be pruned, do they? I mean, think about it. What comes to mind when you think about being pruned? Most of us think about these great big pruning shears, don't we? God comes in, He cuts some things out, and He cuts some things off. In our spiritual lives, we think, you know, I did something bad, and now God has to come in, and, and He's got to prune me. I rebuild, I resisted, I sinned, and now God has to punish me. When I mess up, I can expect God to come in and prune me, so I'll get right back in line. But I want you to look how Wikipedia defines pruning. Wikipedia says the purpose of pruning is to shape the plant by controlling or directing the plant growth. <laughs> To maintain the health of the plant or to increase the yield or quality of the flowers and the fruits. See, God really prunes us for those same three reasons. He, he prunes us to direct us in the way we should go to keep us healthy emotionally and spiritually and physically. He, he prunes us to cause us to be even more fruitful. In other words, so we can be happy and joyful and live the abundant life He desires us to live. And notice, Jesus doesn't say that God just cuts off the branches that don't bear fruit. He prunes the ones that do bear fruit. He prunes those that don't bear fruit, and He prunes those that do bear fruit. Joyce Meyer says, you're pruned if you do, and you're pruned if you don't. We think God only prunes us when we mess up or we walk in sin. But God prunes those that are already doing it right, those who are bearing fruit. But this much I do know. If I have to be pruned, I'm glad it's God the Father, God the gardener, God the loving vine dresser who does the pruning. I'm glad I don't have to prune myself because I might not bear any fruit at all. I like some of my non-fruit bearing branches and if I was to prune myself, I might not cut those off. And no disrespect to anybody in here, but I'm real glad some of you ain't doing the pruning. Whatever pruning is, I'm glad you ain't the ones doing it I'm glad it's my Heavenly Father's responsibility to prune and not yours. Because some of the branches, some of the things that God leaves in, some of the things you prune away, even with the best intentions, might be something you prune away and cause me to bear less fruit. I love you, but I ain't giving you pruning shears and tell you to go locking off all my branches. The bottom line is, you're pruned if you do, and you're pruned if you don't, so you might as well bear fruit, because you can't avoid the process. Thankfully, Jesus just gives us simple instructions on how to bear fruit. Now, just because they're simple doesn't mean they're easy. 
But Jesus tells us to how to have the fruitful life, how to have the abundant life, how to have the rich and the satisfying life He desired for us to have. Verse 4, Remain in me and I will remain in you, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Seven times in four verses, Jesus says to remain in Him or to abide in Him. When we remain in Him, the abundant life, the rich life, the satisfying life, the joyful life flows through us, and the result is bearing fruit. You know how important is fruit bearing to God? A little while later in the same chapter, Jesus says, I have appointed you to go. You know, that's the Great Commission. And produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. See, our dreams, like the apostles, our dreams are too small. By remaining and producing fruit, we find our greatest fulfillment for now in this life and eternity for the life afterwards. You think all this would be easy, but it isn't. Right? I mean, it's simple, but it's not easy. Verse 2 in the NIV says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. And verse 5 says, He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Now I want you to imagine that if all our lives in here were like baskets of fruit. You know, we line them all up against this, uh, this stage. You know, some of them probably wouldn't have any fruit in them at all. And maybe some of them might have a little bit of fruit. And maybe there were some others in here that would have some fruit. But I pray to people in here that would have baskets of fruit that were full and overflowing. According to Bruce Wilkerson, who wrote The Secrets of the Vine and the Prayer of Jabez, he asked his audience about fruit bearing all across the country. And he says the level of fruit bearing is pretty much consistent wherever he goes. He said about half about half of all people who say they're Christians produce little or no fruit at all. And then he says about another third bear some fruit. But he said only 5% of all confessing Christians bear much fruit. The question is, is, does this surprise you? But the more important question is, where do you fit? I mean, which basket is yours? Do you have a basket of no fruit? Or do you have a basket of a little fruit? Do you have a basket of some fruit? Or do you have a basket that's full and overflowing with much fruit? If Jesus desires abundance and expects abundance, how can we find fulfillment in a half-empty basket of fruit? And the answer is you can't. If your life bears no fruit, God will intervene and He will discipline you. The scriptures say, just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. But the good news is, as the loving gardener, he lifts you up and he cleans you off to help you bear more fruit. But sometimes it's a painful process. But once that barren branch starts to thrive, once it begins to hold great promise for the abundant harvest, then God starts in and begins to prune. And sometimes that hurts too. Read a story about a man who, who bought a house out in the country next to a vineyard. And him and his family, they're looking forward to getting to know the owners because they see this great, great vine running right down their property. So after they move in, they want to get to know this neighbor real bad. But, but one day they notice him and he's out beginning to cut down all the grapevines. So out of curiosity, the, the dad walks up and says, uh, I guess you don't like grapes, do you? Man said, I love grapes. He said, Well, then why are you cutting down all these vines? The man looked at him and said, You're a city boy, ain't you? He said, You can either grow a bunch of printed leaves or you can grow a bunch of good grapes. But you can't have both. If you want a lot of good grapes, if you want a lot of fruit, you got to do a lot of pruning. And you know what? Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between discipline and pruning. And you may even under misunderstand. God's method, because He wants to cut away your immature commitments. He wants to cut away your lesser priorities to make room for an even greater abundance. But look at your life. If there's an abundance of sin, then it's probably discipline. So repent. Stop doing what you're doing so you can bear fruit. But then God comes in and He begins to prune so you can bear more fruit. To get a great harvest, God has to reduce he has to reduce, he has to prune, he has to thin, he has to cut some things out of your life so that you can keep moving from some fruit to much fruit. 
The gardener's secret to more is less. If your life bears some fruit, God, the vine dresser, will move in and begin to prune you. The gardener cuts away unnecessary shoots because a vineyard's only purpose is to produce fruit. Pruning is a gardener's most important method for a plentiful harvest. God cuts away the parts of our lives that drain the precious time and the energy from what's truly important. So the question is, will you say yes to your heavenly vine dresser? If you're being pruned, God is trying to get your attention. You don't want to go through all that pain and let it go to waste, do you? Jesus told his followers to count the cost. And when they did, many of them turned back. But the ones that said yes are still shaking the world today. And I want you to know that not every painful experience that you go through is a result of either discipline or pruning. We live in this fallen world, but I will tell you this, every painful you experience that you go through in your life is an opportunity to let God work in your life for abundance. The Apostle Paul, who wrote to the Christians in Rome who were being pruned by persecution, he said, we know that all things God works for the good of those who love Him and those that have been called according to His purpose. The pain comes now, but the fruit comes later. And some of you know the trials and the risks and the things that Paul had been through. And you know the size of his harvest. Paul's branch is still yielding fruit even today. And sometimes we don't know why God does what He does. I mean, how do you explain to a young child, to a baby who's sick, that the needle that they're about to get is going to make them better? You know, you can't. You know, sometimes you just have to hold them and let them know everything is going to be okay. We only know God has our best interest in mind. He asked us to let go of our reasoning, to let go of our rights, to let go of our fears, and just simply throw our arms around His neck. And these are the times when we just simply have to pray, Father, I'm hanging on to you. You can do whatever you want to me, but just carry me through it yourself. Trials will come. Trials are going to come. It's unavoidable. The question is whether or not you're going to let the, the pruning of God do its work, or you're just going to let it go to waste. You can do what I do so often. You know, so often I complain and I rebel and I compromise and I run away. Or you can experience the comfort and the rest that comes to the disciples who keep their eyes on the prize and not on the pain. I mean, it all comes to this. Verses 5 and 6. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. After discipline to remove sin, after pruning to change priorities, remain in Jesus. Only by remaining in Jesus, Him and you and you and Him, can you enjoy the most rewarding friendship with God and the experience the greatest abundance for His glory. Only by remaining close to the vine and absorbing all it has can you have the abundant life, the rich life, the satisfying life, the joyful life that God intends for you to have. Remain means to, to stay closely connected, to settle in for the long term. Jesus knows that he's leaving his friends. He knows he's about to be betrayed and, 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 and arrested and, and die on a cross. He knows he's about to leave his friends, yet he says we must be together. Abide, remain in me. I mean, don't miss that command. You don't have to command a kid to eat ice cream, do you? It's easy to get a kid to eat ice cream. You command somebody to do something because it doesn't come naturally. To remain in Him, we must act. Without me, you can do nothing. Imagine a grape marriage that's been cut off for the vine and it's just lying in the dust. It would be impossible for, the, for that cut off branch to provide one new leaf, one new flower, or even one new grape. If we don't remain in Jesus, we wither and we die. We become of no spiritual use. By remaining in Jesus, we seek, we long for, we thirst, we wait for, we see, we know, we love, we hear, we respond to a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. You know, I think sometimes we just make it too hard. We think we have to know all the scriptures. We think we have to have all this theology. We have to have all the answers. We have to go out and tell everybody about Jesus by beating them over the head with a Bible. Evangelizing and preaching and knowing scripture is important, and it may bear some fruit, but it doesn't always bear much fruit. The abundant life, the rich life, the satisfying life, the joyful life is a matter of the way we live. In these verses, we see fruit bearing isn't an activity. It's not something we do occasionally. It's the way we live. In reality, it's simple. 
You know, most of us come to the Lord because we saw we were helpless. I mean, we come to the Lord more through adversity than we ever do through prosperity. And we see that we can no longer trust in ourselves, so we come to, to Christ. We, we want to put our trust in something that's bigger than we are. Jesus is saying you have to stay close to me to be a productive Christian and to bear fruit. The amount of fruit you bear is going to be determined by how close you stay to me. If you're barely attached, you'll barely be productive. The branch can't bear fruit by itself. It must be attached to the vine. Neither can you bear fruit by yourself. You must remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I am him bear much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. And, you know, some of you might be thinking, in some degree we know this is true. Well, I can do a lot of things without Jesus. What I think Jesus is saying is, you may be able to do some things without me, but whatever you do without me is never going to bear any fruit. Without me, you're just a bunch of dead twigs. You can only bear fruit if you remain in me and I remain in you. And then Jesus says, and I love this, this is so great, verse 7. But if you remain in me and my words remain in me, you... You can ask my Father for anything you want and it will be granted. When we remain in Jesus and He remains in us, we bear fruit. And when we bear fruit, we can ask God for anything and it will be granted. But here's what I know. Here's what I found out. The closer I grow to God, the more my heart is changed. The closer I get to the vine, the more my desires are God's desires. And when my desires are in line with God's desire, He gives us what we ask. I don't ask God. For the same thing I did 20 years ago. I don't ask God for the same thing I did 5 years ago. I don't even ask God for the same things I asked God for a year ago. The more I get pruned, the more dead branches God takes out of my life, the more my will is lined with His will, the more desire, my desire is in line with His desires, the more He answers my prayer, and the more my life bears fruit. You know, when a tree bears fruit, when the great fire iron bears grapes, who are the grapes for? I mean, does an apple tree eat apples? Does a grapevine eat grapes? The, the fruit's always for somebody else, isn't it? Who is the fruit of a Christian for? When we produce much fruit, should it be for our glory or for someone else's glory? Verse 8, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples, and this brings great glory to my Father. When somebody produces an award-winning garden, garden, an award-winning flower, who gets the, the glory? The garden, right? The same principle here. When we produce much fruit, the gardener, the Father, is the one who gets the glory. In the pruning process, God is always cutting the branch closer and closer to the vine. The gardener prunes those who are clean by his word. Once you understand that, your heart begins to say, okay, I don't mind so much the pruning process anymore. And you'll begin to thank God for cutting some of the things out that maybe you thought were important. Because to bear fruit, we must be continually cut closer to the vine. And Jesus said he was the true vine. We've got to continually be cut closer to Jesus. And those things that keep us and hinder us and suck out of us the nutrients that Jesus has for have to be cut away. Andrew Murray said, God loves us too much to let the word, to let the wood flourish at the expense of the fruit. And so often the church and the people in it, we get so concerned about having to do the work of the church that our lives don't produce much fruit. I mean, do you think a plant ever worries about growing? It just abides. It drinks and it takes in the sunlight and it grows and it produces fruit. And just as a branch gets life from the vine, so the believer gets their life from Jesus. The Lord not only calls his fathers to carry out his great commission and to live a godly life, but he also gives them the power to produce much fruit. As a branch must receive its nutrients from the vine, so a believer must receive their nutrients from Jesus Christ. And we don't bear fruit by gritting our teeth and doing what we hate. Do you think a grape branch just bears fruit by thinking real hard and pushing real hard and hoping some fruit pops out? Or do you think it just soaks up the nutrients from the vine and the fruit just comes naturally? The branch receives life from the vine. It's the same thing with us. We bear fruit by remaining in Jesus and Him remaining in us. 
To bear fruit, don't go after fruit, go after Jesus. And the closer you get to Jesus, the more fruit your life is going to produce. Pruning can be hard. You know, I, I know in my own life, you know, God came along with his great big lopping shears and he began to prune some things out of my life. He cut off some dead branches. He said, Rob, that good job you had, all that money you're making, it's keeping you from growing closer to me, keeping you from bearing much fruit. Flip, flip. Rob, that business, that business you have, it's a good thing. And it's bearing some fruit, but it's never going to bear much fruit. Flip, flip. That house which you said would bear much fruit, it's become a stumbling rock, rock, Rob. Flip, flip. Rob, your fancy motorcycle, all your cars, your boat, it's all got to go. It's not producing any fruit. Flip, flip. Clip. You got some friends, and I know you love them, but they're dead wood. They aren't clean. They haven't been purified. They're holding you back. Clip, clip. That ministry, that church, those people that you love so much, they're never going to produce much fruit. Oh, they might produce some fruit, but they'll never produce much fruit. Rob, this is going to hurt. But clip, clip. One of my older children told their mother, or told my mother, their grandmother the other day, she said, I go after all I can because I don't want to suffer like my dad has. And I tried to explain to her, this isn't suffering. It's just God pruning some things out of my life that, that weren't producing any part, uh, any fruit. The closer I get to the vine, the less fruit of this world I want, and the more fruit of the next world I desire. It's hard sometimes that the more God takes away from me, the more fruit I can bear. And when I bear much fruit, Jesus says, you are my true disciple. And that brings great glory to my Father. So how do I make this practical? How do we remain in Christ? How do we get this power from the Holy Spirit? Let me tell you a simple formula I heard in a men's retreat. You keep your snout to the spout where Jesus comes out. Remain in Him and He'll remain in you. Keep your snout to the spout where Jesus comes out. In prayer and worship. Through prayer we gain strength and we stay connected with Christ. And through worship we gain strength and stay connected with the body of Christ. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Keep your snout to the spout where Jesus comes out in the study of God's Word. We study God's Word not so that we can know Scripture, but so that we can know the Son, so that we can know Jesus Christ. And if we know the Son, then we're going to know the Father. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. See, it's one thing to read a biography of an author and know about the author. It's another thing altogether to know the author on a personal and an intimate level. God doesn't desire us to know about Him. God wants us to know Him personally. And intimately. Keep your snout to the spout where Jesus comes out in Christian service through action. Through Christian service, we bear much fruit. We're the hands and feet of Christ. When we remain in Him in Christian service, the Holy Spirit empowers us to serve others and to work and grow in Christ-like service and to bear much good fruit. And when we do, we glorify God. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my true disciples. Keep your snout to the spout where Jesus comes out in Christian fellowship. The Bible says, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. We're not designed to be a single branch hanging from a tree. We gather strength as we fellowship together. We remain rooted and we remain grounded in God's love as we fellowship together. We grow in Christ as we fellowship together. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Not branch, but branches, plural. There are many branches on the vine giving strength to one another. And when you do, you'll become, I'll become, the Odyssey Church will become a place where there's much fruit. Where true disciples will make more disciples. And those disciples will make even more disciples. And will make it easy to find and follow Jesus and lead people into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. When we put our snout to the spot where Jesus comes out, we'll bear much fruit by leading people from where they are to where God wants them to be. When we put our snout to the spout where Jesus comes out, we'll bear not some fruit, but much fruit by reaching the unbelievers, by ministering to the unconvinced, by serving the underprivileged, by maturing the upright. When we put our snout to the spout where Jesus comes out, we'll not only bear fruit, 
will bear much fruit. And ask you, it's Diane uh, and Jimmy come up to play. You know, I just want you to think about it. I want you to ask yourself this. Am I coming to church or am I becoming the church? Because if you want to bear much fruit and you've been made clean by the word of God, will you at least consider becoming a volunteer in one of our ministries? And if you have a ministry that maybe that's not listed and you want to be part of that and, and it's not listed, just write it down. I'll, I'll be glad to get a hold of you later this week. Or, or maybe you're a new Christian and now you've been purified and you're just beginning to know Jesus is who he says he is and, and you've never been baptized. Well, next week we want you to get baptized. This is going to be a great service. If, if you want more information, just see me or one of our lead team, one of those people with a lanyard around their neck after the service. And if you still aren't sure if Jesus is who he says he is, or maybe you got some trials and tribulations, you're like, will you join us next week? And, and will you come back next week and maybe bring somebody with you and be part of something bigger than all of us? Will you come back and be part of the body of Christ? And I want you to know, if you need prayer, or you'd like to know more about Jesus, or today you'd like to make him Lord over your life as Diana and Jimmy play, will you please join me at the altar? Will you allow me to pray for you right now? And then Jimmy and Diana will begin to play, and you can come forward. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for these words of Jesus as he, he tells us to abide in him. And Lord, we just ask, we, he commands us to do this because he knows it wouldn't be easy that you would help us. But Father, we don't do it for our glory. We do it for your glory. Lord, help us to understand the pruning process. Help us, Lord, as you take things out of our lives, that you draw us closer to the vine, Lord. Help us, Father, to bear much fruit. And Lord, we ask this in the precious name of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.